Napoleon, during his campaign in Egypt, went among his soldiers who were dying by the hundreds of the Black Plague. He touched one of them and lifted a second to inspire the others not to be afraid, for the awful disease seemed to spread as much by the aid of the imagination as in any other way. Goethe tells us that he himself went where there was malignant fever and never contracted it because he put forth his will. These giants among men knew something we are slowly beginning to find out, the power of autosuggestion. This means the influence we have upon ourselves by believing we cannot catch a disease or be sick. There is something about the operation of the automatic or subconscious mind by which it rises above disease germs and bids defiance to them when we resolve not to let the thought of them frighten us, or when we go in and out among the sick, even the contagiously sick, without thinking anything about it. Imagination will kill a cat, so runs the old adage. It certainly will kill a man, or on the other hand it will help him rise to heights of achievement of the most astounding nature, providing he uses it as the basis of self-confidence. There are authentic cases on record of men having actually died because they imagined they were cut by a knife across the jugular vein, when in reality a piece of ice was used and water was allowed to drip so they could hear it and imagine their blood was running out. They had been blindfolded before the experiment was begun. No matter how well you may be when you start for work in the morning, if everyone you meet should say to you how ill you look, you should see a doctor, it will not be long before you begin to feel ill, and if this keeps up a few hours, you will arrive at home in the evening as limp as a rag and ready for a doctor. Such is the power of the imagination or auto-suggestion. The imaginative faculty of the human mind is a marvelous piece of mental machinery. But it may, and usually does, play queer tricks on us unless we keep constantly on guard and control it. If you allow your imagination to expect the worst, it will play havoc with you. Young medical students not infrequently become frightened and believe they have every disease on the medical calendar as the result of medical lectures and classroom discussions of the various diseases. As has been stated, hypochondria may often be superinduced by toxic poisoning, through improper elimination of the waste matter of the body. Also, it may be brought on by false alarm through improper use of the imagination. In other words, the hypochondriacal condition may have as its cause a real physical basis, or it may arise entirely as the result of allowing the imagination to run wild. Physicians are pretty well agreed upon this point. Dr. Schofield describes the case of a woman who had a tumor. They placed her on the operating table and gave her anesthetics, when, lo, the tumor immediately disappeared and no operation was necessary. But when she came back to consciousness, the tumor returned. The physician then learned that she had been living with a relative who had a real tumor, and that her imagination was so vivid that she had imagined this one upon herself. She was placed on the operating table again, given anesthetics, and then she was strapped around the middle so that the tumor could not artificially return. When she revived, she was told that a successful operation had been performed, but that it would be necessary to wear the bandage for several days. She believed the doctor, and when the bandage was finally removed, the tumor did not return. No operation whatever had been performed. She had simply relieved her subconscious mind of the thought that she had a tumor, and her imagination had nothing to work upon save the idea of health. And as she had never really been sick, of course, she remained normal. The mind may be cured of imaginary ills in exactly the same manner that it became diseased with those ills, by auto-suggestion. The best time to work on a faulty imagination is at night, just as you are ready to go to sleep, for then the automatic or subconscious mind has everything its own way, and the thoughts or suggestions you give it just as your conscious or day mind is about to go off duty will be taken up and worked on during the night. This may seem impossible, but you can easily test the principle by the following procedure. You wish to get up at seven o'clock tomorrow morning, or at some hour other than your regular time to awaken. Say to yourself as you are about ready to go to sleep, I must arise at seven o'clock tomorrow without fail. Repeat this several times, at the same time impressing the fact upon your mind that you must actually arise at the precise moment mentioned. Turn this thought over to your subconscious mind with absolute confidence that you will awaken at seven o'clock, and when that hour arrives your subconscious mind will awaken you. This test has been successfully made hundreds of times. 
The subconscious mind will awaken you at any hour you demand, just as if someone came to your bed and tapped you on the shoulder. But you must give the command in no uncertain or indefinite terms. Likewise, the subconscious mind may be given any other sort of orders, and it will carry them out as readily as it will awaken you at a given hour. For example, give the command as you are about to go to sleep each night for your subconscious mind to develop self-confidence, courage, initiative, or any other quality, and it will do your bidding. If the imagination of man can create imaginary ills and send one to bed with those ills, it can also, and just as easily, remove the cause of those ills, the value of which is said to be about $26, with the exception, of course, of that stupendous power called the human mind. In the aggregate, the mind seems to be a complicated machine, but in reality, as far as the manner in which it may be used is concerned, it is the nearest thing to perpetual motion that is known. It works automatically when we are asleep. It works both automatically and in conjunction with the will, or voluntary section, when we are awake. The mind is deserving of the minutest possible analysis in this lesson because the mind is the energy with which all thinking is done. To learn how to think accurately, the teaching of which is the sole object of this lesson, one must thoroughly understand, first, that the mind can be controlled, guided, and directed to creative, constructive ends. Second, that the mind can be directed to destructive ends, and that it may voluntarily tear down and destroy, unless it is with plan and deliberation controlled and directed constructively. Third, that the mind has power over every cell of the body and can be made to cause every cell to do its intended work perfectly or it may, through neglect or wrong direction, destroy the normal functionary purposes of any or all cells. Fourth, that all achievement of man is the result of thought, the part which his physical body plays being of secondary importance, and in many instances of no importance whatsoever except as a housing place for the mind. Fifth, that the greatest of all achievements, whether in literature, art, finance, industry, commerce, transportation, Religion, politics, or scientific discoveries are usually the results of ideas conceived in one man's brain, but actually transformed into reality by other men through the combined use of their minds and bodies. Meaning that the conception of an idea is of greater importance than the transformation of that idea into more material form, because relatively few men can conceive useful ideas, while there are hundreds of millions who can develop an idea and give it material form after it has been conceived. Sixth, the majority of all thoughts conceived in the minds of men are not accurate, being more in nature of opinions or snap judgments. When Alexander the Great sighed because he had no more worlds, as he believed, that could be conquered, he was in a frame of mind similar to that of the present-day Alexanders of science, industry, invention, etc., whose accurate thoughts have conquered the air and the sea, explored practically every square mile of the little earth on which we live, and wrested from nature thousands of secrets which, a few generations ago, would have been set down as miracles of the most astounding and imponderable sort. In all this discovery and mastery of mere physical substances, is it not strange indeed that we have practically neglected and overlooked the most marvelous of all powers, the human mind? All scientific men who have made a study of the human mind readily agree on this, that the surface has not yet been scratched in the study of the wonderful power which lies dormant in the mind of man, waiting as the oak tree sleeps in the acorn to be aroused and put to work. Those who have expressed themselves on the subject are of the opinion that the next great cycle of discovery lies in the realm of the human mind. The possible nature of these discoveries has been suggested in many different ways in practically every lesson of this course, particularly in this and the following lessons of the course. If these suggestions appear to lead the student of this philosophy into deeper water than he or she is accustomed to, bear in mind the fact that the student has the privilege of stopping at any depth desired until ready through thought and study to go further. The author of this course has found it necessary to take the lead and to keep far enough ahead, as it were, to induce the student to go at least a few paces ahead of the normal average range of human thought. 
It is not expected that any beginner will, at first, try to assimilate and put into use all that has been included in this philosophy. But, if the net result of the course is nothing more than to sow the seed of constructive thought in the mind of the student, the author's work will have been completed. Time, plus the student's own desire for knowledge, will do the rest. This is an appropriate place to state, frankly, that many of the suggestions passed on through this course would, if literally followed, lead the student far beyond the necessary bounds and present needs of what is ordinarily called business philosophy. Stated differently, this course goes more deeply into the functioning processes of the human mind than is necessary as far as the use of this philosophy as a means of achieving business or financial success is concerned. However, it is presumed that many students of this course will wish to go more deeply into the study of mind power than may be required for purely material achievement, and the author has had in mind these students throughout the labor of organizing and writing this course.